Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech, everybody's favorite biotech podcast. My name is Matt and thanks a lot for joining me. Coming at you live from beautiful Southern California. And uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and watching me. And please let me know what you think. Like, subscribe, or leave a comment. I appreciate all the feedback that I get. Uh, so today what I want to talk about is uh, two stories that I thought were particularly interesting. One has to do with Gilead, a company that I was invested in and recently sold my shares. And I'll get into why I did that. And the other one is a story about uh, what's well, actually an article uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine about how a uh, closed loop glucose monitoring insulin delivery system might be good for type 2 diabetics. And for those who don't know, the type 2 diabetes market is substantially larger than the type 1 diabetes market. So it could be a boom for companies that do continuous glucose monitoring like Dexcom or also ones that have a, a good closed loop system like Tandem Diabetes, which I've touched on in my previous videos. So with that, let's get into it. Um, I'm not going to do much of a uh, wrap-up video with my portfolio, uh, the markets. I just haven't had time to, to update all my stuff, but I'll tell you the moves that I made this week, and uh, we can go from there. All right, so the news that I want to talk about is the recent departure of another executive from the Gilead team. So the chief executive officer, the chief scientific officer, and the chief medical officer, I believe, um, have left or they're poised to leave in the next little while. And these three guys were uh, pretty much essential in, in bringing Gilead to where they are today. And that includes the successes around their hepatitis C uh, drugs, as well as their HIV program, and even really the CAR-T stuff that they're starting to do, at least the acquisition there. So these guys are all leaving, and it's not entirely clear why they're leaving, but I think um, you know some of them are, are later in their career, and they're just ready to, uh, to retire. But I think... Um, it's interesting because this company is going to be a, a quite a crossroads in terms of where they're going to have to go to find new sources of, of income because as we know the hepatitis C drug medicine that they have has been so successful that the business is now no longer generating the kinds of revenue that they had at its peak a couple of years ago so this article I thought was was a good overview even though it was a pretty negative outlook of where Gilead's going to be uh, given the the lack of CAR-T growth they've seen with Yaskarta. But uh, I think I thought it was an interesting um, outline, at least, of where the company stands today. So, uh, as we know, they, so they released their Q2 earnings a little while ago, and uh, some of this is, comes to no surprise. Their, um, their uh, HCV products have decreased in um, revenue, it's actually kind of leveled off right now, so I, I don't know if we're going to see a bigger dip in, in that revenue. They've seen a slight increase from their HIV sales, and the Yaskarta showed uh, $68 million in sales during the second quarter. So I think the Yaskarta, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I think people were a little bit disappointed in these sales. They were really hoping for more, given that CAR-T has been hyped up as much as it has. But given how much, how intense, resource intensive the treatment involves is, like somebody needs to take the cells from the person, the T cells, they have to be engineered and then put back in the person. I think uh, there's a lot more cost associated with it as opposed to just a one-time injection of a, of a regular medicine, a regular um, biologic or a small molecule. This is actually a cell therapy, so it's a lot more intense. So this article really highlights how the traditional uh, means of income that Gilead's had is now going away and they're, they're moving towards new programs and they really need to find success in these new programs if they're going to continue to be a successful pharma company because otherwise they're going to start losing, um, losing uh, all their market share from their HCV portfolio and uh, you know HIV is doing okay. But so I, I put together a model for where I think Gilead is and I'll tell you why I, I sold my shares. So I bought a few months ago when it was at 80 something. I hadn't done a ton of, of research into them other than they were successful at the different uh, in hepatitis C as well as in HIV. Um, but I, I decided to sell today because I don't know we there's too many unknowns surrounding their growth and it depends largely on whether or not they're going to see success in a bunch of different trials. But I think that G 
given the large decrease in the hepatitis C business, which was a huge part of their revenue, uh, I think we need to be more, or I need to be more convinced at their future trials before I'm ready to put my money in there. So this is an outline of their balance sheet. Um, I've broken down all the different medicines that they have. And so I took this actually from Martin Shkreli's uh, original model, but I've updated it with the new medicines that they've included. Um, things like Escarta, Bictarvi is a newer one that they've added. It's just a new sort of formulation, and, uh, and I've broken it down. So Harvoni, which is the big uh, HVC business, is, uh, is now doing you know 90% less sales than it was doing at its peak pretty much so their guidance is to uh, has told us that this year they're gonna make 20 billion dollars they said between 20 and 21 billion dollars and I've outlaid um, sort of the breakdown in terms of the uh, the cogs the R&D and the taxes things like that to get an estimation of where we're gonna be at in terms of earnings per share and net income now uh, assumptions that I've made in this model are that the hepatitis C business are going to decrease 5% from now until you know the next few years. I don't know if that's necessarily um, fair, but I don't think hepatitis C is necessarily going to disappear. I think that it's going to decrease substantially and then there'll be sort of a basal amount of hepatitis C that just goes on and that's uh, that's going to be largely the, the customers that, that need this medicine. HIV, on the other hand, uh, this business has expanded in the last few years. So we can see here, I think the last from the guidance of this year, if we break it down um, to the year before 2017, uh, it's about a 4% increase. So I, I, I made an assumption that that is going to continue at 5%. That's a, I think that's relatively generous given that there's a lot of competition. Um, so Gilead's really good at the HIV stuff, but I think that they're seeing a lot more competition from GSK and other uh, players with a lot of trials out there. So I don't know if they're going to be able to maintain this kind of growth throughout, but I wanted to be relatively generous here, and then you'll see what my actual outcome was. Now, the lymphoma treatment, um, on the other hand, so it's pretty early. It, they, they're estimating about $200 million this year, or I am, based on this, uh, this guidance here. And... Uh, you know, we don't know how much that's actually going to grow, given that the the CAR T is very much in its infancy. So I've made an assumption here that it'll grow at about five percent, and uh, and this could be um, an underestimation. I think if there's anything that's weak here, it's this one because the um, we don't know how uh, much better this treatment is going to get as it as it as more patients use it, and whether or not more doctors are going to want to prescribe it. So as it stands right now, this CAR-T treatment, it's only to be used under the doctor's discretion after they failed, after patients have failed two other types of um, treatment. So um, until it gets more, until it's used more often and doctors are more comfortable with it, I don't think we're going to see a ton of growth in this area. Uh, so I set it at, at 5%, and this, I think, could be um, undervalued in, in my model. So if we break it down, and uh, so the other category, so they Gilead has a bunch of medicines, and the ones that are in other, I think I also increased them at 5%, or no, I've decreased them at 5%. So they might actually stay flat, but I think, you know, even if they decrease, we break it down, I have a modest increase in R&D, SG, uh, SG&A, and the COGS, and uh, and with that, we, we end up with about a... 10% decrease in revenue in 2019, but we get a pickup of about 1% from there and then 2% from there on. So if I make all these assumptions, I end up with a net present value of 97 billion divided by the 1300 shares that exist, and we have a share price of about what it's at today. I think it closed around 3% uh, from this price, but I think that the assumptions that I've made are relatively make put a good outlook on the future of Gilead unless they see a bunch of positivity in their trials. So the net income that I've included here um, also includes 
Yeah, so it also includes what they've projected to spend on things like acquisitions and um, collaborations and things like that because Gilead needs to prepare for the impending loss of revenue they're going to get from hepatitis C and even HIV. If it doesn't grow um, continuously, they're going to they're going to stop gain, getting money. So uh, they need to do a lot of collaborations with other companies, and they've done that. And they actually have a decent pipeline right now that I'm excited about. But I'm still not comfortable buying at this price because I don't think they're undervalued, even with the acquisitions that they've done. So if we look about the different at the different programs they have, um, okay, I'll talk about that in a second. So they they have a lot of different programs and ones that I think can actually do really well. So they're they're continuing to innovate regarding their HIV program, which is good. They're they have a few Nash products that they're looking at, and they're already at phase three with one of them that I'm a little bit excited about this. Uh, Salon Sir Tib, which is this apoptosis signal regulating kinase 1 inhibitor. So uh, there are phase 2 studies here, and they saw that when treated at 18 milligrams once daily, they uh, the amount of patients that had one or more stage fibrosis reduction was 43% compared to 20% in controls. So not bad. Not uh, not crazy, but I think we'll we'll see more in the phase three whether or not there's actually something there. So I'm excited about Magical for their phase three, um, but you know Gilead has been very successful in the past, and uh, we'd have to wait and see what's going on. Now the other product that they're looking at is this FXR receptor agonist, and for those of you who've followed me before, you know I'm not very excited about FXR um, with the intercept product that leads to. Um, a decrease in, in fat and fibrosis in the liver but they move that fat into the circulation and it leads to um, a uh, more insulin resistance and hypercholesterolemia which is for those who don't know it's like a comorbidity so usually when you have NASH you also have type 2 diabetes or you also have atherosclerosis so moving the fat into the blood I don't think is a great thing so I'm not as excited about this FXR agonist um, but salon certib might be might be great. So, and Nash is huge. If if they're able to get success here, this could be another blockbuster. But obviously, we're going to see that uh, a lot of competition in this area as different companies are able to get their drugs through phase three. So the other exciting thing with their CAR T, they're they're doing um, modifications on that protocol uh, in order to use CAR T for different things. So, like I've explained in my other CAR T videos. Um, it's a it's a method of reengineering T cells so that they attack something that you want. So, with the traditional CAR T, it's the CD uh, CD19 receptor that preferentially binds to tumor cells in the blood. So, if you can change the CAR part to something else, something that attacks uh, solid tumors, something that attacks. Um, what is it, lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL, then then you already have the, the method to do it. You just need to change the insert that you're engineering the T cells to have. So I don't think it would be very difficult for, uh, for Gilead at this point to get different indications for CAR-T because they already have all the distribution networks, they have everything figured out and the regulations set up already through the acquisition of Kite to do this. So I think it's very possible that they're able to get success in different types of cancers using the CAR-T system that they already have. Now, we actually need to see some data from that. And that's why I, I kind of sold my shares is that I'm not ready to sign off on it yet, given these unknowns. So, and they're also doing stuff with inflammation and you know, so it's it's good stuff in the pipeline, but right now I think that they're relatively fairly valued given the unknowns. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to talk about related to Gilead is the estimation of people with HIV. So the number of new in HIV infections globally is actually going down quite a bit. So this isn't so even though their their HIV business might continue to grow as they try to like solidify market share, you know. There's not an increase in HIV infections, so I just, I don't know if even the 5% that I allotted them here, um, which is now their biggest business, is is a good assessment. So that's where I'm at with Gilead. Let me know what you think. Leave me a comment. 
uh, let me know what you think and uh, you know we'll go from there okay so uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is this exciting article I found in the NEJM by uh, Leah Bali at all uh, I don't know I didn't really read where these people were from but I think it's just some okay it's a university Switzerland Anyway, the reason why I'm excited about this is uh, I've always had an interest in diabetes and uh, insulin delivery and glucose monitoring and things like that. And uh, a lot of the continuous glucose, blood glucose monitors, they've really focused on the type 1 diabetic population because they usually, with a non-continuous system, they have to needle stick themselves um, like five to six times per day in order to get an accurate reading throughout the day. Uh, and like check their sugar to see where they're at so they can give themselves insulin or whatever so that they can maintain that. Um, but in the event of, or in light of the new continuous blood glucose monitors, uh, these things just sit subcutaneously and they just populate the data for you so you don't have to actually needle stick yourself unless you're actually doing the calibration for it. Now, the, the companies that are involved with this haven't really gone after the type 2 diabetic market because a lot of them number one aren't insulin dependent and uh, number two they only need to check their their sugar like once or twice a day so it's not as an intense thing as it is for type 1 diabetics so this paper is actually coming out and saying that um, well actually let's go through it so they took uh, 136 adults who are insulin dependent type 2 diabetics and they put them into two different groups one group had uh, continue a closed loop insulin delivery blood glucose monitoring system and the other group had a just the normal system that they used to measure their their sugar and uh, they left them for 15 days and uh, saw whether or not one was able to maintain their sugar better or not and I guess it shouldn't be a surprise but the group that used the closed loop system was able to be in the target range 66% uh, of the time compared to only 41% of the time in the control group. So the reason why this is so important is that one of the, the detrimental things about diabetes is that if you're unable to control your blood sugar, uh, you end up with a lot of the secondary effects of diabetes like the neuropathy, the um, cardiomyopathy, the uh, blindness problems, things like that, everything that affects the nerves. All of that happens if you're unable to control your blood sugar. So if companies, if we see more articles like this, I think companies like Tandem, like Medtronic, like Dexcom can actually start marketing their products to these patients who are insulin dependent diabetics, type 2 diabetics, and, and convince them that it's worth it. And if they convince formulators to pay for it, that would be even better because, you know, if there's a group of patients that are going to get secondary effects of diabetes that wouldn't if they used a closed loop. Um, insulin delivery blood glucose monitoring system then it might be worth it for them to actually get these patients on um, one of those products and this of course would open a whole new avenue of patients for uh, Medtronic, Tandem, uh, Dexcom and I think it would be uh, better also for the patients because they wouldn't have to deal with these negative consequences so I thought this paper was interesting it's only one study so we got to keep our eyes out for the next studies that come out and hopefully are able to reproduce this and uh, and yeah so that's all I got for you guys today um, let me know what you think leave a like comment or uh, subscribe that would also be good and uh, gonna wrap it up or actually I forgot uh, I'll tell you guys what I did so I sold my Gilead uh, I sold some uh, magical like I said I would and uh, I bought a little bit more um, Illumina just based on Illumina, I think they uh, they offered some some debt on the market, so their stock went down a little bit, and uh, I took an opportunity to buy a few shares. So that's pretty much all that I've done. So I have a little bit more capital to play with, and uh, we'll wait and see until and decide what I do next. Uh, all right, with that, I'll actually wrap it up. So thanks a lot for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.